Hey, I'm Vicky, E with Vicky, and I'm today making salmon salad sliders um, topped with pepper jack cheese. And of course, I toasted my good old buns for Mr. Donnie. Subscribe to the Danny Houston Podcast, man. Yeah, man, it's going down. It's Donnie Houston Podcast. I am Donnie Houston. Check it out, man. Uh, we got a special guest, man. A, uh, a real legend. You know what I mean? Um, when you talk about, you know, graphic design and, like, photography and, like, imaging and just the way this city was presented, you know what I mean, for a specific time, especially the time when we were really on the main stage, you know, in those, two, in those 2000s. This guy was the one responsible, man, for... The majority, if not all of it, you know. Um, hey, man, I'm honored to have him here, man. Mike Frost, what's going down? Man, thanks, Donnie, man. I appreciate that. Appreciate the introduction, too. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's uh, That was a time, man. That's what uh, people ask me about it now and, like, what I'm doing now. And, you know, I look at that time and it's like there, there's no way to recreate that. And there's no way to, like, as far as being a kid from the city and and – bringing it to that point like i don't there's nothing else i can do to 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 match that time mm -hmm. so yeah no it's uh and i think too like as i get older i realize like basically designing the entire city is like it's it's so rare that there's like one designer and one photographer who gets to capture all the artists at the same time for not only like a generation, but for a region and for a, a revolution in, in music, like a whole, you know, I don't know, an era. It's not an era. It's like Houston has its own style, its own thing. So being able to do like the visual representations for everybody in the in the scene at a time, like, man, to me, it's just, yeah, it's an honor. The more I think about it, the older I get, the more I appreciate like, like what it actually is. Hmm. Is that, that's what I was going to ask you now. Is it like, can you sit back and reflect and see like, oh man, I did that and kind of like sit on that. You know what I'm saying? Because you know, a lot of times when you're working, if you're really into your work and you're not like super egoed out, you know what I mean? You're kind of just going through it and you're not really like taking in like what it may be, you know, um, influencing or like affecting on people or whatever. You know what I'm saying? You know, I, ne I never even, because yeah, you're, when you're in the moment, like you just live in the moment. Um, I didn't even realize actually what I did until it was all done. Like so, at the time, now I never even thought about it. And like now, it's just I just have appreciation for it because it's like, you know, it's. Uh, I think I think a lot of people in Houston, especially back in the day, you're from a city, you're in the middle of the map, you're not in New York, you're not in LA. Like a lot of things, entertainment industry seem so far away. So to be able to create something here. And then be known for it here, like, um, yeah, no, that's an amazing thing. Hmm. So tell me, man, like, how did you even, how did you even get in position to like do that? Like, how did you, when did you start getting into graphics and all that? Did you start out wanting to do that, or just something you kind of fell into? You know, I, I I worked at a comic book shop, and a bunch of my friends were like, you know, I like to draw. They like to draw. Some of them were in punk rock bands, so I started hanging out at like Fitzgerald's. You know, drawing like little hand-drawn flyers and stuff. Um, you know, I grew up on the north side, Gulf Bank in 45. So, you know, after that, I transitioned, like started going to the rave parties. And I was doing like rave flyers for that community. But, you know, living in the neighborhood, like, you know, everybody was talking and stuff. And Orbit came over once. I went to high school with him. And he started telling me about use of music, which I wanted to be in the music industry. Like, that's kind of what always what I wanted to do was make art for for music hip-hop I mean, or just music in general music in general i never really care what it was the uh and then orbit started telling me about about you know the south side the north side and kind of broke down the the story at the time like where everything was at um he told me about pen and pixel existed and i i was kind of knew then like man i'm gonna go in that direction what what year is this we 1998 
Hmm. Oh, so Pen and, Pic- uh, Pen and Pixel was like fucking on. They were on. Like, I actually went there to get a job and they turned me down. Hmm. I mean, I, what, what was the what was the feedback like? We're, not, we're just not hiring, or we just not you're not you're not what we're looking for. Man, I never got that far. I actually went to the bathroom, and when I walked out of the bathroom, I was walking down the hallway, and they were like debating because I didn't have an education, I didn't go to college, and that. Um, you know, I think their interview process you had to like draw and like come up with a concept, and then they had like a library as a clip art, and you, they kind of had a formula, and. I, I don't so you had to I, do it within their style of. I don't. Yeah, I, I just don't think I was a, a fit, you know. So, you know, I don't blame them for the decision. It was whatever, but the. Uh, did that turn you up? Like, you know what? Now nah, I gotta do this shit now. You know, it, it. What it did was, I wanted to go in that direction. That was the only game in town that I could go and get a job and do it. So what they did was they forced me to do it on my own. Um, but you know, Orbit asked me to do his album cover for the Kamikazes, and then you know, shit just started coming after that. You know, Russell Washington at Big Time Records came, had me redo some logo stuff. I met Sylvia Coy at Copy.com. She was like having Photoshop issues. I didn't even know who she was, but I was like, man, you need some help, ma'am. Who, and, who, uh, is, who is Sylvia? Coy? Sylvia Coy. Oh, you talking about SPM? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like, ma'am, you need some help. So I helped her with a Carmona Car Show flyer. And then she started sending me flyer work. So I got into Dope House. Um, you know, after so are that, you doing are you doing album art at Dope House or just more like they just had me stuff, they, you know? they wouldn't they wouldn't have me do flyers. I remember a conversation. I was like, SPM, let me do your album covers. He's like, Frost, you ain't ready. I'm like, oh man, fuck you. <laughs> I'm ready. So it just one, you know, I just. It was like put blinders on, man. I was just going after it. And then, uh, you know, I did this this Kick Door Bandits record. Um, and that was some, some Mexican dudes from the north side. And then G-Dash saw that. He was from the north side. Um, then he came up. And I was doing like a bunch of raid flyers at the time still. I had that office off Westheimer and Dash came up. You know, he gave me that Archie Lee job, like the first album they put out. Hmm. And... Uh, you know, I think at that point is when I realized, like, okay, you know, Pen and Pixels competition and stuff like that. And at first, I was just trying to imitate what was cool in Houston. But, like, that was the point I really started to notice, like, okay, I need to strategically think about this. And you know, that's when I really started to develop, like, my own style. Um, and back then, I just went really raw with everything. You know, which was, I, I looked at, like, the old NWA, I looked at, like, the older rap covers, and I was like, you know, why don't we just, instead of bringing people to the studio, let's just, let's just go out to the streets, let's shoot it in the streets, and start making the covers that way. Hmm. And then, uh, you know, that's, and then I just noticed things, too, I was like, well, all this stuff looks like mixtapes. It looks like it's not serious. So I was Dash. I was like, you know, Dash, it don't cost anymore to make these make these mixtapes look like real albums. I was like, I can just copy all the legal stuff on the back, like package it up professionally. It may cost like $100 more. So let's start putting everything out, all these mixtapes. Let's make them look like real albums. I think that, you know, that had a big effect earlier. But the, uh, yeah, man, I was always, it just, it just started growing from there. Like it's all word of mouth. So I mean, as far as like the, what I mean, because everybody else it's used to hip hop. When you're talking about like really getting into it, Swisher House, that was really the ones that really kind of got you into the, the game for real. That like led to, a lot of what other what you other eventually went on to go do. Really, a lot of that stemmed from the Swisher House thing. You know, I didn't I didn't really know what was going on at the time. <clears throat> um, you know, I was working with Dash and Watts, right? And uh, he brought up like a little Mario project. He brought up. Uh, I think it dash brought it up i don't even remember because swisher house was going through things too at the time like a reorganization right so it was kind of like everybody from what i know now i think everybody just hey this is who dash is using so everybody that was around swisher house knew swisher house followed swisher house started started coming to me um but at the same time, like 20 to, 20 to Life, PSK 13. Oh, big time stuff. Um, big time. So I was getting work from other parts of the city 
too. So I didn't realize I was building up a name on, on both sides of the city. Hmm. Um, and, it, you know, it just kept going from there. Um, was, you know, I was doing stuff for SPM at the time, too. So he did... What did he eventually allow you to do the covers, or this is you still just doing like little, so little things? So he didn't. No, nah, he didn't. What I did with them was I told this story before, but what I did with them is they would only let me do flyers, and then some of the stuff they were just having me like remake, not remake, like remix stuff. Pen and Pixel did for like you know the chopped and screw version, or just you know make it purple and put a chopped and screw logo on it. But I was kind of like, all right. There was this one album, The Lone Star Riders, and this dude Lobo gave me the, the pictures from the photo shoot. So there was already an established cover for it that Pen and Pixel did, and I was like, all right, if I want their work, I'm going to have to pay to prove I can. So I redid it and printed posters of it, and I went, I knew all the studios where they're at because I'd stop by and hang out sometimes. So I went and hung it up on the wall at Dope House, like right next to the, <laughs> the official one. And then Happy Perez saw it. Happy was like, nah, I want, I want this one. Hmm. So he picked the work I did over that. And after that, Dope House started letting me do the covers. That was actually my first major job, like for, for Universal, I think he was with. Yeah, that yeah, was my was first. Universal, for sure, hell yeah. That was the first time I had like, made serious money doing a cover. I think I got paid like 7500 for that. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Okay. Because I don't understand the, the graphic world, like, and especially back then, you know, I know how I know how music was being sold and like the numbers on type of stuff. What was the average graphic design like going rate? You would say back then. You know, I in the beginning, I one thing I did in the beginning was I knew like the established style was like that golden diamond stuff. I started pumping all that stuff out on flyers. Um. But the established rate, like what I did, like those things, it was so easy for me. I would just do it like 50 bucks. You know, a lot of people complain about young designers now. Oh, they're doing it too cheap. Like, I did it cheap too. Like I pumped out shit as fast as I could. But I knew I was building the name by having my name on back of all that stuff. The, uh, I was just going to outwork everybody. But I just started adding like $50, $100 every time. Every like month or two, I just slowly increased the price. Because I didn't, I didn't know what the prices were. The uh, when I charged Universal, I just threw out a number. Like now, I know that was actually cheap. Probably could have got twelve grand. The uh, that's what I was asking. Like like twelve thousand. You could have got twelve thousand for. <coughs> yeah, I got I got twelve thousand for uh, for Slim Thugs uh, already platinum. That's just the graphics, no photo shoot or nothing. And I didn't know like on that. I can I can go to that story later when we get to that time. Um, you know. Everybody's financial, it's, it's whatever you can get for it really is a graphic thing. I know when you get to a major level, not only are, are, especially back then, the way printing was, you're having to, like the layouts that you're having to do, like you're having to do the CD layout, you're having to do it in a professional way, you're having to do it in like Quark Express, you're having to package the fonts, you have to do the logos a certain way, you have, you have to do multiple versions. Like they're making you turn it in in a way they can go back to that 10 years later and reprint so on that cover i mean not put the design to the side on the back end work that people don't really see there's another 100 hours 150 hours of work so when you look at that today like i'm you know with what i make today you know on a on a, on a corporate level it's a fair price but when you're when you're dealing in the streets like a lot of stuff in the streets i don't have to do all that like i can i can lay that stuff out fast send it to the press so it's it's just the design time um i knew pen and pixel was charging like 4500 7500 to cover um so i knew like when it i just kept i just kept incrementing up hmm. um you know but one thing back then too is there wasn't too many games in game in town like i was here pen and pixel was here a few other people were here uh black cat was here uh, uh kid styles was here you know orbit worked up there with me the uh you didn't have a lot of options too so you know once once i realized i was getting preferred 
to get used by everybody. I just kept moving the price up. Hmm. So then, okay, we go from we go there to SPM. When do you start doing uh, like the zero and you know? Is it, well, that's really around that same time then. Man, you know there was. So I always have to look at it, what office I was in. So I was in the Westheimer office, like right there. It's like on the curb on Westheimer, uh, in between Montrose and Shepherd. So when I was at that office, that's where G Dash came up. Um, that's where the Twenty to Life. That's where like the first SPM album cover was done at. So that was kind of like a era. I got with that payment I got from the SPM project. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna go get a bigger office. So we moved off to Fondren and Richmond. Um, and that's actually Trey just called me up one day and he's like, you know, he wanted to he wanted to come up and we're talking about the cover and you know he was just getting started. So I was like, man, you know what? I'll help you out, you know, to get it going. Um, so I actually had just bought my first camera that day. Um, and zero was up there dougie dougie d was up there so we just pulled the camera out of the box literally shot pictures like us sitting in the studio like this and made the gorilla mob resurrected cover but that's where zero and that started but okay you said you bought your first camp so prior to that you weren't shooting you were just doing graphic design man i would get a i, I hired a couple people to to shoot sometimes but a lot of times we would run out there with a disposable camera you just get it developed at Walgreens. So actually, some of the classic stuff is disposable cameras slapped on a skin, Walgreens. That's why I be tripping sometimes when people be so focused on the camera, but sometimes it's just it's capturing the moment and it's it's the style of shit that makes it classic. It's not you know. Can you take me through that process? Cause I know about you know you got Photoshop and all that now, which makes it so much easier. But like back then, let's say we had Photoshop back then. So, you, so you, go ahead. Oh, I've been on Photoshop since like, man, I'd say 1997, but I wasn't, I was, you know, designing other stuff. Photoshop's been around 1996, seven, I think, available on desktop. So we had that. Um, cameras, you had to, you either, you had to have a film camera. There was no digital. That didn't come around until way later. Um, but none of us could afford, you know, cameras and stuff, so... We just used disposables, went to Walgreens, bought a disposable. And you take that film and... Take it, develop it at Walgreens, and scan in the uh, images. That was... Uh, and then I figured out you could drum scan things, so we started drum scanning film and just kind of kind of moved up there. Orbit had photography skills. So when we actually moved offices, um, you know, he was taking some of the pictures... So we we found I found a camera rental place and started written uh, is light tech, and we started written cameras, uh, camera equipment. Hmm. But first I bought like a digital camera. It was like this six megapixel digital camera. I only I think it was like five megapixel. Um, I think it's like a Panasonic. It was some off brand like Panasonic or something. Now that's not off brand. Back then it was. Wow, and that was a resurrected because I never forget walking in the blockbuster music and seeing that, and I was like, yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. One thing about the camera is like, you just have to you have to operate in their capabilities, so you can't really do group shots with those cameras, because you, it just doesn't have the the resolution for it. But you can do like resurrected. You can do these close up face shots, and you can get you can get that quality. You can get the quality image. So. Like, if you look at all the early slab stuff where I try to do a big group shot with it, super low resolution. Right. I was wondering if that was intentional or if, or if that, you know. No, nah, that was just camera shit. Just, just how she came out. Yeah, because that's, you know, that's why a lot of that early stuff, too, is like face, face close-up stuff. Because I was looking at New York and L.A., too, at the quality that was produced. Like, when you looked at the stuff, it was just razor sharp. So I was trying to figure out how to do that. You know, how to do that with lighting, how to do that with the cameras. Um, and I was trying to figure to do that with really no budget. Like we didn't really have the, you know, I bought some equipment with the SPM job and I move offices. So, I mean, it was always a struggle to upgrade the equipment and still pay rent to, to keep, keep chasing that quality I was going after. I had you tell the story before, but just a little bit, just for the sake of, you know, for the show. 
The Gangster Five cover. Uh huh. Like talk about that and the shit just being spelled wrong and it just kind of you know what I mean. Man, that was the picture. So the picture comes out of Trey's garage on the west side. And it's just it's a picture I had. No, actually, that picture, the picture that was traced off of came off the uh, a photo shoot that Orbit did. And on that, I don't know, Trey just came up and said he needed a cover. So, man, we spent about 15, 20 minutes on that. Just pumped it out real quick and no spell checking, none of that. There's some, I, got, I got some funny-ass typos on some covers. Like uh, I know I misspelled Magno's name Mango on one. I still ain't lived that down. <laughs> but that's one, and nobody even really recognizes it's a misspelled. Like you have to point it out on the gangster fight. No, I, I didn't for years until you pointed it out to me, and I was like, like we just. And somebody asked me too, like man, maybe I should fix it. But I'm like, nah, yeah, leave not it at this man. point. I'm gonna leave it. But you know, a lot of times like Dash would come up. A lot of those covers, man, just you know, like a hundred bucks real quick. I do five a day. It's five hundred bucks a day. So they would come in. I mean, there's times I used to just empty the shit that, that's out of my pocket. Like it'd be like a hundred dollar bill, a couple hundred dollar bills, like some weed, condom, some keys. Take a picture of that. You know, that's the cover. Yeah. So it was a. Uh, and we used to do shit fast. So Orbit was under you. You're saying. Is, Man, there any, or, is there anybody else that went on to be somebody that was kind of under you or working Orbit, with you? Orbit's too much of a homeboy. I can't say he was under me. He was, uh, and you know he he enlightened me about the whole Houston rap game so he uh we worked together on stuff the uh with him the um you know there was we definitely had had some issues on stuff but you know looking back like it's just it's such small stuff the uh I we just worked on stuff together man he was uh he was into graphics um I was into graphics like I had a screen press at my house um he was he was taking a college course at Photoshop. You know, I was I've been on Photoshop for years, so um, we connected on that. I mean, at high school, he made these because Chester che Chest like our high school thing was the the cheetahs, no cougars. I think it was cougars. Whatever he did, we did these Chester cheetah cougar whatever T-shirts for the high school football game. And we did all the art, burnt the screens, printed them in my garage. He went to the game. He, he sold completely out of all them shirts. Came back the next day, we printed more. He sold out again. So our relationship started like that. It was like, you know, I was a tech guy. He had the hustle. And uh, we tried a bunch of different. We were going to do a newspaper back then called Paperboy. The, uh, you know, we, man, we've, we've helped each other out a lot in our careers. Like, mm -hmm. Now every time I see him now, man, it's all of it's 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 such a good time. Like we just went to Miami recently and acted a fool, but the uh, yeah, but he uh, he had his own thing. I, the the collective I had, everybody had their own thing going on, right? I mean, at that time, way back then, I was trying to collect people. Like I needed programmers, right? Because I was really trying to get ahead of all the e-commerce and all that stuff. Um, you know, a lot of work would come through. So, I mean, one time, I remember Orbit was like, he was kind of complaining, like, man, everybody's coming to you. Like, send me some stuff. I was like, man, do whatever comes through the doors next year. And then Paul Wall and Chameleon Air come in for that uh, Get Your Mind Correct. Which is, I don't regret it, because that cover, he did such a good job. It's so classic. But, you know, I'm like, fuck. Man, couldn't Joe Blow come through or something? <laughs> but I already said it, so I had to I had to keep my word on it. I mean, he did him a solid. The hell yeah, a solid. You I can't I mean? say Orbit ever is under me because he gonna he gonna call me after this interview and be like Frost. That shit ain't cool. Mm -hmm. Nah, but we we all work together, man. Everybody had their own thing, um, their own space, and we just all we all work collectively. Like I had my thing, Orbit had his thing. Um, Bruno was there, he, rest in peace. Um, he was doing like websites and coding. A guy named Ben was there. Gracie Chavez uh, was there helping us with writing. The, uh, this DJ named Chris Anderson and the Raves thing actually helped me get the first office started. So it was really just, it was a creative collective. Like I've always fed off everybody else's creative energy. Like I, I like having that environment. Probably like now, that's probably one of the things I miss most 
is having that creative environment. So if I had an office, anybody that wanted to work, I had a computer, I'd just invite them up. They could pick a corner, and we just all sit there and work on shit and bullshit all day. Hmm. Man, okay, so talk about when, um, because, I mean, the game, like, changed, bro, when, when everybody got their deals and shit, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, it like, did. How did that change for you? Man, there was a lot of shit that went on then, so I knew before, I just had a feeling before everything blew up, because I was like, I mean, I could just go by my own feelings on shit. I'm like, man, I'm tired of hearing New York. I'm tired of hearing L.A. Like, you just, it's not that you don't like it. You just heard it so much. And I'm like, where else can, you know, New Orleans has been hit. Like, where else can, can, it, can, can the rap industry go? Like, there's Chicago. There's Atlanta, which you already had. Outcast, that was already done. I was like... Business-wise, it makes most sense for majors to come here because these dudes are already making a shit ton of money. You know they want a piece of it. So I saw it coming. Um, the uh, I remember I went to Interscope. So I was like, I'd never been to a major label. Oh, I went once with Hat to New York, but I'd never really been on business. It's a kind of a, a embarrassing story, but I'm going to tell it anyways. The, uh, Man, so I was like, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to California. I'm gonna go up to Interscope. Just go in, talk to everybody. But I came. I took my my desktop. Wait, why Interscope? Is this when Slim had his thing going on? This when Slim had his deal. I took my desktop computer up to Interscope, like ready to work. (laughs) I didn't have a laptop, so you know they're looking at me like, what the fuck is this kid? But you know, I, I didn't know. I didn't know any better. I was like, I'm used to using like. Hey, wherever I go, like, because, you know, like, when Killer Mike called me to do an album cover in Atlanta, man, I, I, I didn't have a laptop. I don't even think a laptop would have ran the graphics back then. So I, I took my desktop, took a monitor, got a hotel in Atlanta, invited Killer Mike, came to the hotel, we did the photo shoot, knocked out the whole album. I was used to working that way. Like, it was just grind. So uh, I thought the whole world worked that way. But I remember Interscope, I was just like, all right. <laughs> it was embarrassing, but... You know, so it was but, like, uh, yeah, Mr. Frost. Uh, it did change then too, because that's when, it, you know, I was charging people like twelve hundred fifty, twenty five hundred for album cover before before I went there, and I went there, and I can't remember the guy's name, but he's like, is twelve five okay? Or is like, I think he said like, I think he said like twelve five or something. Whatever he said, I was like, I was thinking like twelve hundred fifty bucks for the cover. Man, they hand me a check, and I looked at it, it was like twelve thousand five hundred. I was like, fuck. So then, Mike Jones, all the other people started hitting the majors, and I was like, 15,000. And then I started taking like all the magazine ad work, all everything that went with that project. I, I, I took all that money, too. Um, the Interscope, me and them got into it a little bit, because they, 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 they accused me of plagiarizing the Mike Jones cover. The Who is Mike Jones? Yeah, with Slim Thug. And I was like, and you know, my, my point at that time was like, I, my whole goal was to put Houston on the map. Like, I wanted everything coming out to be unapologetically Houston, like all the way through. But they saw Mike Jones and they saw the Slim Thug. And they, if you're from Houston, you're going to look at them and be like, they're totally different. But they were like, I was plagiarizing that and i was like how can i plagiarize my own fucking shit i was like i'm about houston i know you got your mission but i got my mission too so the next job i think they were trying to move me out so that was for a uh, boss of all bosses so i made sure with that one i was like man it's too much money so i had like about 10 grand in my pocket i was like you know what i'm gonna self-fund the entire project and when they have their meeting to look at like rough drafts I'm going to turn in the whole project so just to get the money. Hmm. That's crazy. Yeah, so it, it changed like that. And then other things ch- changed too. When I was in L.A., like having a technology background as well, they had all the billboards for the iPods. You know, back then we, we were all Napster and shit and all that stuff, which was, was hurting the mom and pops and stuff. Um, but I looked at those things and, you know, I was in Dallas with Happy Perez, and he had the iPod, and he's like, man, this is the greatest thing ever. I got all my music in one place. And I was looking at all the billboards, and I was like, the CD format's done. Because I, I went from, you know, the tape to the CD. 
I was like, the CD format's done. I'm out of a job in a couple of years. As far as like the format, because thinking about how that's going to affect everything, with it's, the digital, yeah, yeah, it's going to kill the mom and pops because the mom and pops are already low margin. Um, the uh, you're not going to need print stuff. There's going to be no inside the album covers. Um, you know, the internet too did its thing on street promotion. There used to be a lot of street promotion. Now everybody's on the internet. Um, so it's there's uh, no need for flyers and all that type of shit. You need stuff, but it, the thing was, is, is I just knew the game was changing, and I knew the transition was going to take so long that, you know, I, I'm just having a kid. I can't wait 10 years for this shit to come back. Like, so I had to, you know, it, it was a little bit of that, and it, it just it changed when I got back. And then everybody kind of f- coming to me for the art. They wanted the same things that they saw become successful. But, you know, as an artist, like, once something's done, it's dead. Like you, you gotta, you gotta evolve. Um, so people were trying to keep you in that same creative space of like the majors war. Everybody was. I think everybody was kind of like panicking or kind of like, you know, everybody became an expert too, kind of thing. <laughs> um, but it's a, uh, you know, if you kind of got your 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 finger on the pulse of things, like I just it changed the whole thing. Wiped out the mixtape market completely totally wiped out the mixtape market so the mixtape market the mom and pops the street promotion all that shit went at, at exactly the same time which kind of paused houston when you think about it it cut us off at the top and paused us in this like this uh urban legend counterculture you know what is it called uh there's certain films where they're like um it's just it's uh I can't think of the word from it. It's something culture. It's like, uh, fuck. Um, you know, it's when something is like really, really popular, but it's n- not, it never hits the top of mainstream. Um, comic books could be considered that. It's like a subculture. So, like, you know, Houston has been in this, like, iconic status, I think, for so long because we, everything got cut off. It never actually got played out. Mm. Hmm. Wait, wait. So you 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 were you've been saying like you had this uh, technology background. Mm-hmm. What were you doing? You, you said with the technology, like with that. I've been coding websites since ninety four, ninety three. I was doing websites before any any of the other stuff. No shit. I was coding. So the uh, and I was always. But how'd you how'd you get into it? Because you said you didn't go to school for it, right? Just like Photoshop or anything else or photography, you just fuck with it. Just reading books and then messing with it. You know, when in about 2013, about 2010, I was like, okay, I can go shoot videos. But I was like, okay, the cost of the video camera, I know what I did to the, with the digital camera because I was one of the first people with a high-res digital camera. Like, I crushed it. Um, so I was like, all right. But I couldn't do videos still because videos hadn't evolved on the digital format yet where you could do them. Um, but like 2010, like iPhones and stuff start coming out. I was like, you know what? Cameras are about to get cheap. Everybody's going to be able to do videos. The price of it's going to come down. Like what I do know how to do is I know how to code and all this other design stuff it has is a secondary skill. You know, I had a baby, a wife wanted to go to law school. So, you know, I took a position at Exxon in communications using the skill set. but I backed up, it was my coding that I backed up on that actually got me you know, they hired me to be the designer, but that's why I've been there 10 years is, is having all the skills. It's having the coding skills, the design skills, the video skills, the 3D skills. Like, I, I can fill so many positions there. It's like even a lot of young designers, like, you know, I had a bunch of people, like, ask me advice on, like, career. And I know they wanted to be in music, but I was like, and I, I didn't mean it as ego. Like, I was like, you're not going to do what I did. Like, you have two choices, like you can go work at somewhere corporate get paid for your work you know fairly and invest in your own creative identity and project or you can link up with the artist and you and that artist can build a brand together and i th- you know that's the only way i see success because there's not going to be another person that just runs the, the whole town like that because the game's changed it's not going to be like that anymore 
so they would always ask me for advice and i know they wanted to get the music but i was like always telling the opposite like nah do do work for corporate corporate or big business get paid for your stuff invest in yourself mm. you know or if you got bread or, or backing just invest in yourself build your own brand you know and that's something still today like you know that's still a dream of mine is actually to build up not my name and, and my reputation as a designer but actually build a brand that's mine that's not dependent on anything else hmm. and what is that what would that look like man it's going to be some sort of it's going to be probably toys or something cartoon character based you know I've, I've started one project we're restructuring some of that right now but my mind's pretty much focused on that. I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep punching at that until I get it. Hmm. Is that? Is that? So that's kind of like where you are, like for the future. Like that's really what you focus on. That's what I want to try next. I want to get into like uh, toy manufacturing, uh, animation. Um, you know, at I'm 47 now, I've got you know another 20 years. Hmm. Like I've always done things for other people. Like even working for artists, like it was. It was never really about me. It's always been about them. Um, I mean, if you look at the artwork, it's... I was always trying to bring them, who they are, their character out. Like, I'd have creative ideas, but... You know, you edit a lot of stuff out because you're creating something for someone else. So I was always creating things for other people. You know, the next 20 years, I want to create something... I'm actually... I want to have fun with it. I had fun back then, but so no, I'm say, I mean, you, I mean, was it work? Like, I mean, no, I had a lot of fun. It was a lot of work, a lot of stress too. Hmm. You know, it just bills. Everybody got that bill stress. Yeah, for sure. But you know, sometimes pressure, pressure. If it wasn't for the pressure of having to to to, to grind, you know, none of that stuff would have ever got done. So, you know, sometimes that that you know what they say that that pressure makes diamonds or bust pipes. Hmm. So it just, you know, I guess in this case it made a diamond, but the, uh, I actually think if I just quit my job right now and started focusing on toys and animation, it should get done a lot quicker. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Could put that get done back I mean, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fucking, um, what, what, is there anything that you, that you really hang your hat on? Like, this is my, like, I did this, you know what I'm saying? Um, do you know... The, uh, I really just look at the collection of work as a whole. Like, there's not a single thing. I, I think when you look at, when you look at all the work as a whole, like right now I'm finally starting to, I'm seriously starting to work out on a book um, with everything in it. And I think, I mean, as far as I did this, it's just when, I, when I'm sitting at my computer and I'm looking at the collection as a whole, you know, that's, that's that thing. You said work on a book. Is this a is this a like autobiographical or more like a photo book type thing? Uh, it's going to be a little bit of both. Um, it's definitely going to be a photo book. The uh, and I, on my Instagram, like I've kind of been rough drafting things, just mainly to to commit it to memory and also public publishing it out in public. Like I, it forces you to write things un like exactly how you remember it. Um, so I'm taking all that, and then I have, you know, I have 100,000 photos. So, you know, 50,000 have never been seen, or more than that. Like, they've never been seen. So... Is yeah. there anything that you have that you're like, I know I have this that people haven't seen, and I know it's, like, super dope? Yeah, I have a lot of that. Mm -hmm. I have a lot. Of, some of it is an if. I have to get... i I got to raise about 16,000 to get the drives recovered. I have two drives... I have eight total, but two of them have work all the way back to like 2000, like photo shoots, stuff like that. So there's all the, all the Dope House stuff, all the early Scarface stuff, all the early Devin stuff, all the early Rapalot stuff, all the, you know, there's like, there's shit I've forgotten about that's on those things. Um, like I'll run into a cover sometimes that's on like Spotify, and I'm like, oh fuck, I forgot all about it, I did that. So... There's a, if I can get those back, there's there's some dope stuff on there. But even then, I've got tons of Chameleonaire stuff and Paul Wall stuff, Trey stuff, Zero stuff that people haven't seen. Hmm. Do you have like your top five like favorite covers? You would say, Devin the Dude, uh, 
the acoustic levitation uh-huh. stylistically like as far as my own personal style you know, like with what the I legs love. and uh, yeah. yeah you know we shot that i spent like three weeks working on i mean i was driving around town i was climbing up on top of buildings i was like trying to find the the right scene of houston and i like drew it and all this stuff and i was like man this is what i'm looking for and he's like you know i got drone footage so he we pulled the drone footage and i was like and i already had the drawings of like the feet up and so i was like you know what man we grabbed the iphone i was like put your feet up so we took some pictures and i was like he's like no no i gotta change shoes and put the adidas on so we shot that off his drone and a an iphone um, but that covers that's one of my favorites stylistically uh paul wall's people's champ because it was just uh i think i've seen that on like one of the internet's ugliest album cover list <laughs> but you know for me it, to me an album cover is supposed to get attention like and i don't i always say this i don't care if you hate or love something all i care about is the people who are gonna love it love it and the people who are gonna hate it hate it and how large how much you motherfuckers talk about it that's all i care about like as long as you're talking i'm happy so that particular cover was like i knew when i made it i was like oh yeah this is gonna piss a bunch this is gonna especially back then i was like yeah people are gonna talk so much shit about this or they're gonna love it so the uh boss of all bosses Mm. is a favorite that was you know it was it was it sucked that like the music industry crashed at that one point because like me and my team were reaching our peak and that cover is like really an example of what we can do when we're fully funded we do shit the way we want slims are always great about showing up and you know like a lot of artists will kind of complain about shoots or and quick to go and stuff like that but you know slim paul like some people are always super patient let's do everything we need to do make sure we get it right and you know to me that covers one of my favorite because that's an example of what we could do in the right situation right so if music didn't crash at that time and we kept escalating um i think i was just prepared to do major work at that point um gorilla mobs one of my favorite ones the uh that self-titled zero me and orbit did together um man there's a bunch of them like uh trying to think through the list even the, even the mike jones cover i love that cover too mm. i like a lot of them but yeah those those ones that i named are a lot of the paul wall stuff like um so when i basically had to stop i was kind of like man just just fuck it like i'm done like people ask me to do the same thing i just i just wasn't into it anymore it wasn't the same so like 2013 i just stopped you know, I talked to Paul, I was like, man, you know what, I don't feel like doing this shit no more, but just to stay relevant and doing shit, like, man, just bring me your albums, I ain't gonna charge you nothing, just, I'm gonna do your albums, and like, you know, I think the only stipulation I had was like, I want to do creative shit, um, but when I started doing stuff back, like, in 2017, 18, like, at that point, I ain't really give a fuck about anything in the past, and like, I was like, okay, if I'm gonna do new shit, I'm... I'm gonna do it my way. I'm gonna do shit I like. So, a lot of the covers since then, like I really like. That was like that Akira one I did for Paul. Um, the uh, that illustrated one. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Devin's acoustic levitation was a part of that. Yeah, I forgot what other ones I've done since then. Mm-hmm. The Big Pokey. Um, yeah, since I, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. The the recent Big Pokey one. So. That's what's up, man. Well, shit, bro. Um, fuck, bro. I appreciate you coming through, man. It's fucking yeah, hard, dog. Yeah, appreciate you having fucking me. Fucking goat, man. Do you know that shit? Hmm? Fucking Mike Frost, dog. You fucking oh, goat, shit. man. Do you know that shit? You made me blush, man. Yeah, wow, bro. It's for real, man. Oh, man. I did the photo shoot on J-Dog yeah, two nights ago with Big Sid. How'd it go? Man, he was lit, but it was so much fun. But, man, he was just like the whole, Mike Frost out here. You a fucking legend. I'm just like... <laughs> I mean, it was great, man. I love seeing J Dog. We gotta. I mean, he couldn't stop talking and laughing the whole fucking shoot. So his cover might be him just laughing, which might be a good thing. But no, nah, it was great to get out and you know, I just did a shoot for Ballshog Outlaws. I'm gonna work on with Georgie. 
I'm excited about that. Mm. Yeah, doing something for Paul probably next week. Still fucking killing it, dog. Yeah, I think I think now I have a different pressure, like especially when it's Paul or J Dog or something that people are actually watching. Like now I have a pressure, like okay, if it's not dope, I'm not. I know everybody's looking at it, so I'm like I have to make it dope, no matter. So when I take a job, it's like. I might have to work on this bitch for like 300 hours because I can't put out something that's not dope. Hmm. I have to like live up. Back then it was like, man, fuck this shit. 50 bucks. It was just different. Maybe I should just be like that again. But. I mean, it still is. I, but I understand that though because it's like now it's like, oh, this is the Mike Frost cover, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it's almost like... Uh, I think that's why I like the idea of doing cartoons, doing other shit, man, because I don't really have... Like, i almost been thinking about just coming up with another name to do all that shit under because I don't have none of the pressure. Yeah, you gotta tie your identity to none of that. Yeah, I don't have to just change identities for that stuff. Let people figure it out later. Hmm. I mean, hey, man, either way, man, we gonna fuck with it, man. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, so. Hell yeah, dog. Uh, well, shit, when's the book coming, dog? I don't know, man. I'm still, um, I, got, I got three things I gotta do the book. One, I'm gonna do a GoFundMe or maybe like a pre-sale. I've gotta raise, uh, I may be able to do it for like eight grand, but I got to raise cash to get them drives recovered. Um, but I'm starting to work on the book. The only thing is, I was talking to Sid today. I was thinking about doing like a book that's like 18 by 24, mm. like leather bound, only doing a thousand copies, where it's basically like posters um, with all the stories and shit on the back, having it where you can like take, po- I don't, I hope nobody would take them out, but it's going to be like that option. Um, or I might do it like a 12 by 12 inch, but I'm just deciding on the format. Once I have that, I'm going to know like the budget I need to actually print. And then I'm going to put up the, I'm going to start the process and start promoting and put up the GoFundMe, get the drives recovered. Um, I'm just going to have to hustle it out. There's no easy way to do it. It's going to cost me probably hundred grand to make the book. 50 grand less. It depends on how I do it. So. I'm going to have to definitely, uh, it's going to be a challenge. To do it the way I want to do it, it's going to be a challenge. Like, I'm, I'm not going to put out bullshit. Yeah. Not on that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's coming, just not soon. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> thou- if it's a thousand books and it's like $150 a book, yeah. and it's really that fucking dope. Yeah, I, I'd pay the one, yeah. I'm not, I'm not really doing it to, like, make a grip of cash or nothing. Like, I just, you know, it's going to be the legacy piece. So it just it has to be super dope. And I'm probably gonna make it ultra complicated to get done, but I'm gonna get it done. I'm looking forward to that shit, dog. Um, you know, I want to do a whole, like, not just put pictures in there, but even all the printing techniques that were used. Like, um, I, I want to tell the whole story in it, and then a lot of stuff too. I got to do a lot of interviews because if I do a book, it's not really my story. I mean, some of it is, but it's really everybody's story. Um, so I'm a, there's a lot of interviews, a lot of stuff. I'm going to have to sit down and talk to people. Um, that's just, not, that's, hey, man, that's going to be crazy, bro. So. That's going to be crazy. I'm looking forward to it. You know, and then I'm, I'm really, my goal is, is to tell everybody's story, tell Houston's story. Um, you know, break down everything that was going on. Um, so it's uh it's gonna be a little more than a picture book it's gonna you know i I just i want it to be this ode to houston to our our time um you know that that era yeah i've thought about doing a book before then i I wrote it and i realized i'm just making this about me um which falls flat about five pages like i just gave you everything most of my stuff so the uh so I stopped working on it and then, uh, you know, I just matured a little bit and like reflected more, talked to people more. I had more people come up to me and realize like, man, I grew up to this. And they were telling me stories about, man, first time I heard this album, me and my homeboy were riding to Austin to go see a zero show. Um, so there's all these memories and things that are associated with the images that I, I didn't really, I had memories with all of them, but my memories is of doing the work and all that. But now I, like there's so many, memories that people have what what were they doing when that album was released and and stuff and they've associated those memories with those images so a lot i realized well, i needed i want a lot of that stuff in the book 
Hmm. Um, so I don't. It's not going to be about really the rappers. It's not going to necessarily be all about me. It's going to be about the city. It's going to be about everything. And I'm I'm going to tell that story with the images and with interviewing people. And they just make it like sick as fuck. Like, you know, I'm a comic book collector, so I want people to collect this thing and like resell it. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Or well. buy two and like sell one and flip it and make some money as well. For sure. I'm I'm looking forward to it, bro. Whenever it comes, you know what I'm saying. It'll probably be about a year, year and a half, but I'm seriously going to start working on it. And I'm putting up the website now, too, that I'm going to do kind of a, you know, I'm a coder. So I'm programming the site, too, where I'm posting all the projects and stuff, and I'm going to set it up on social media where people can go in and tell their stories. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm going to use what I know on technology to actually collect data and try to automate the, the, the data collection for the stories and, and have that to go through. That's dope as hell, man. You know a lot of different. I didn't know you knew all this shit, like all this coding and shit, and like I didn't know you was that deep into that shit like that. I had no idea, bro. I'm I'm getting to the, the the, expert level. Like I'm I'm, confidently can say I'm as far as like web development, app development stuff like that. I'm. You know how to do apps? Yeah, I can do apps. Okay, we're gonna talk. I don't know you. how to write native iOS, but they have things like if you're coding in Vue.js, right? It's a JavaScript framework. They have these tools where you can take and port your code over to Android and to iOS and turn that into an app. And you can run all your apps and your website off a single code base, you know, that'll connect to some like AWS or wherever your data source is. And now, you know, they got all this like real time database stuff like Firebase has it, Superbase has it, all these companies have it to where you can actually do real time two way communication like Twitter and stuff like that. Um, you can write, you know, you can use a web framework like Vue.js or React, um, and you can convert the single code base into to native apps. I mean, <clears throat> I think there's some sensors and some functions on the phone, like the gyrometer and stuff, you might not be able to get data from with these, but I, I haven't dug in that much into that because I haven't needed those features. Okay, some of that shit just went all the way over. Oh, my head. yeah. It's, uh, but yeah, I have no, other I can, questions, and I'm going to wrap this up because I've got questions. I didn't know you know how to do that shit. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. That's what I do for Exxon. I write applications. Sit down and eat some podcasts. <laughs> 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 no, I, I got hella questions, bro. Um, and we're going to kick it for a minute. I'm trying to. I just filled out an application. I hope nobody at Exxon. I just filled out an application for Astros. I was like, goo, I know you know somebody at Astros. They got this position. I want it. So. Yeah, that's something away from we're gonna we're gonna cut that whole part out. Yeah. Just in case. I don't care. Man, I anything I say you can I, I don't hide from shit. Astros might give it X I might give me a raise or fire me. Either way I might get the cartoon done faster. <laughs> <laughs> Already. We 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 don't hide nothing, man. The truth's the truth. Whatever. And that is, man. Mike Frost, I'm man. We gotta live it. Yeah, yeah. Well I appreciate you coming through, man. Man, I appreciate you having me. It's dope. Yeah, yeah. It's nice to podcast, Mike Frost. We up out of here. Danny Houston. Subscribe to Danny Houston Podcast, man.